presenter is uh, Narinda Kaur Brain. She is from the University of Wolverhampton and she was recommended by the song Kirtan Atul for self specialization. thoughts and opinions at the end or during the break. So uh, my research uh, objectives all kind of focused on the direction I'm going in is looking at um, the creation or the, the identification of Sikh identity uh, within the UK uh, based from a musical perspective, uh, looking particularly at Shanti Gibdan or Gurbani Gibdan. Um, so to pull out in context is how is the identity of the Sikh population in the UK created from uh, a musical perspective. Um, within the Sikh tradition, um, there's, a, uh, there's a variety of things that can help um, to shape our culture and uh, tradition, and that is things like um, Seva, which is um, um, selfless service to the community, Agatka, which is a form of the Sikh martial arts, um, building of community centres and places of worship for dwellers. So there's a lot of things that people do when people migrate first to in, first um, to a new setting where they're trying to establish themselves. But my focus particularly is from the musical side. Um, so there's two reasons why I've kind of drifted this way. And the first one is the simple fact there's very little research done on Sikh identity within the UK as shaped by music. <coughs> Um, and secondly, from a personal perspective, having been brought up with a lot of music since childhood, is trying to make sense of what that means to me now as a second, third generation Sikh. Um, there is a, a quote that I like, um, and if I can remember it, I will tell you, which looks at um, trying to not follow in the footsteps of a, a, a wise person, but actually to try to make sense of what they were trying to what they were trying to seek. And I don't know if a lot of you can relate to that, where you, a lot of us within our day-to-day -day practice are constantly doing things that we just got taught to do. You know, you eat your veggies, um, you should exercise five times a day, but actually to be consciously aware of why you made those choices. So I think um, I'm hoping that this will come out through in the presentation. So I'm going to start off by giving, for those of you who don't know, a little bit of background about the Sikh uh, religion. And then I'm going to dive in a bit about what Gibdan is, so the, the Sikh musical element. Then looking at the angle and perspective of what the scriptures say, um, and then trying to share with you the timeline of how Gibdan has evolved within the UK. And then finally, kind of where I'm going with this, uh, this PhD. So, what is Gibdan? Um, Gibdan is the singing of scriptural sacred poetry known as Shabbats, uh, primarily from the Sri Guru Granth Sahib, which is the um, sacred Sikh, Sikh scriptures. Um, within the Sikh tradition, the scriptures themselves embody the um, wisdom of the, the ten Sikh gurus, and therefore the, it's something that we hold, the Sikhs hold quite highly. The Sikh Gurgatsa has around about 6,000 shabans, uh, pieces of poetry, and each of those is headed by a, um, a melody, a raga, um, as well as a dal, a rhythmic uh, beating system. Um, and it's generally accepted that that is, the, uh, that is the music that should go with that particular piece. Um, I should also just bring into that just the simple fact that the, the one thing that Sikhs all agree on is the Sikh text. And the fact that text is also, um, it has music, um, a melody described to each piece of it, shows the importance of music within the Sikh, um, Sikh faith. So, um, I don't want to go too into the depths of what the Sikh scripture says, but I did find that this particular quote um, brings a lot of the elements of what the Sikh scriptures talk about. So, primarily there's a lot of focus on meditation, on um, singing praises and therefore devotional worship, but also the importance of kirtan, the musical aspect of the Sikh faith. Um, this particular <coughs> quote I like because it says, um, amongst all the other the sounds and uh, melodies, um, that, is, that one is uplifting, which is able to connect 
uh, a person to, um, to uh, a state within, to connect with the divine. And it's that sound and beating system that is true. So to kind of paraphrase what that means is you're looking at, yes, it's good to be proficient in the music and sound, but if that sound does not bring within uh, a sense of equanimity, a sense of connection uh, as, as a vehicle of uh, oneness with the universe, then it really doesn't do its job. And the, the word that they use is jit, which is a, a conscious, um, uh, in consciousness and awareness of, um, of sound. So, um, this is going a lot quicker than I thought. <laughs> um, so, in terms of the historical timeline, the um, first step was, you could say, looking at colonial migration back in the early mid 19th century. So, following um, British rule within India, a lot of people uh, migrated to other Commonwealth countries either as roles, um, either to help with railway, building of railways uh, within Uganda, East Africa. You had um, some. Indians also migrated to parts of um, Singapore, Malaya, which is now called Malaysia, um, to do roles in the security forces, etc. So they were kind of the first migrants. But for, for the UK, the migration came post the war, uh, where a lot of migrants came from Punjab directly into the UK, uh, primarily men rather than women. Women came a little later on. Um, and it was during this time, um, once I think it, it came to, it came to uh, it dawned on the, on the Sikhs that migrated that we weren't going to come here and then just move back, we were actually going to come here and settle now. Um, their wives and families moved here and then there was this sort of need for finding a place of worship, a place of coming together as a community. And it was around 1908 that the first Sikh place of worship, Gurdwara, was established in West London, um, Shepherd's Bush. And what was good with this is it allowed people the space um, to celebrate and have um, festivals and mark religious occasions. But one of the biggest challenges was the fact that they didn't have the skill set at the time to properly do those services. So it would be as if, if I said now we need somebody to sing something, and none of you are singers, it would be a case of, okay, who's got roughly a good sound, uh, sounding voice and who can keep a beat, and pretty much those people would volunteer their services. Um, that was actually very well received, because it's pretty much, you know when you're all in the same boat and somebody actually comes out, you're like, okay, I get you. Um, so the congregation was very supportive, and a lot of the music that was developed at that period didn't necessarily match the melodies that were described in, in, the, in the text, but it was simple enough for people to follow, simple enough for people to sing along with, and so that was quite popular. It wasn't until around about the 1970s um, when you got the first wave of professional rockies, professional musicians came over uh, on their tours through the UK and North America that people started to realize, ah, okay, these people are bringing back that traditional sound and the mu music that we remember. Um, this is great. What about if we employ um, some other people who are also equally trained? And that showed an influx of musicians that came in from India, from Java. Um, to play those certain roles within the Sikh um, places of worship. The, that, was, that had many plus points, but one of the negative points to, to pick out was that they, were, they probably weren't given the status that maybe those musicians should have been given. Um, so what I'm saying is that their salary was pretty poor um, by, those, uh, by, by standards, and a lot of the musicians found themselves um, supplementing their salary through donations by the congregation. So it was like, okay, this guy's a good singer, gets a bit more money. Um, and it, 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 despite the fact that these professional rockies, the musicians were classically trained, um, they found that because of the, the shift within the society in the UK, there was a, a, a greater admiration for Bollywood style music as well as sort of the, the Bangra scene. And therefore, so these, these quite very talented musicians were able to shift their music to meet what you say classic to pop culture music to appease the, the, the sound of the congregation. Um, the positive sides of having professional musicians was that you were able to have people who, who were trained in that profession being able to teach the children or next generation. So we have Sunday classes, Sikhs would have Sunday classes where they learn the musical uh, instruments and that could be for the, the very old as retired and the very young. Um, at the same time, uh, there were summer camps 
to learn to give them to match the for match the children's school holidays um, from yeah from the other general school. Um, so they had the, a lot of the plus points there. Um, following from that, even though now we had established um, professional keepers at these places of worship, there wasn't enough of these spaces for people to to have music on tap. But luckily for us, at the same time, those of you might remember what LP and cassettes uh, and tapes were. Um, I can see a lot of blank faces in this room. But uh, at that time, there was a, a drive within um, uh, India, quite predominantly, of uh, Bollywood um, films that incorporated a sort of religious angle. And a lot of Bollywood singers would sing some of these. So people like Mohammed Rafi, Asha Bosal, they would sing um, Shabbats, so the religious Shabbats, but because they were Bollywood, Singers, they became popular quite quite predominantly. Um, I think most people's houses have had those uh, audio tapes in, with them. Um, fast forward a little bit, and I'm going to divert a little from the UK to um, America. Um, the late 1970s, you had what we call New Age, modernistic, evolutionary style keep them. Prior to that, the main two instruments you'd always see was the harmonium, which is um, it's almost like a German slash European design music that was brought in by the British to India, uh, accompanied by the double which is a set of drums. Uh, you now had a new age music within America, um, primarily shaped by non-Punjabi Sikhs, so we're looking at potentially white American Sikhs uh, who were following a very charismatic leader at the time called Yogi Bhajan, and their music had this influence of American folk music where they used both things like the harmonium, the double R, but also they used guitars and flutes and harps, etc. Uh, one of the probably um, most successful ones from this genre is the, the picture in the middle, which shows Sanat Gore, um, actually in the Oprah uh, And also a few weeks ago, she played at the Grammys. Um, the success of this music um, was prim is primarily because they were able to take it out of just the space of the Gurdwara as a place of the worship and channel it to the mainstream uh, music, uh, mainstream audience. Uh, one of the similarities that the New Age music has is that its ability to involve the, the sangha, the congregation, so people would sing along with their music and it's quite easy to tap into. Um, um, so that was back in the 1970s, but since then there's been an evolution within that and constantly other places. So the, the second picture on the left is a well-known a musician from Australia whose group kind of comprises of um, people of multi, multi faiths, uh, but also they use the didgeridoo, uh, so they use something that's quite unique to their, that area of the world. Um, so, skipping from the 1970s to the 1980s, the 1980s was pretty much a watershed time for this, the Sikh uh, population as a whole, particularly with the political climate between um, in India, and as a result, a lot of Sikhs decided to take music pretty seriously. It was a way to, um, I guess you could say channel pain. Um, we all know that if you're in pain, there's two things you do. You either numb yourself, uh, that could be through food and work and etc., or you go within and actually feel those emotions and work through those. And the style of people that developed in the 80s or became predominantly more popular related to the breath. Um, so meditating, chanting, uh, repeating just the sort of simple phrases with simple tunes meant that people who were the second, third generation in which uh, they had a, maybe uh, a language barrier a little bit or a lack, a lack of knowledge of the, the text were able to pretty much um, uh, be a part of it. it they were, it's something that they could slip in quite easily, it wasn't too complicated. Um, following from the 80s, um, given another 10 years or so, in the 90s and 2000s, we had um, almost like things are now settled. People were trying to figure out uh, ways of being, who they were, and we had a revival of something called the Gurmat Sangeet, which is traditional Gitan styles. Um, so you can see the two pictures at the end, I know they're very small, um, and that's our pictures of the two academies that are based in the UK. So when I, when I say Gurmat Sangeet, I talk about traditional instruments, um, I'm thinking about um, things like the rubab, the rubab, the sungi, uh, which are all uh, instruments that you bow and play that were present at the time, so when the, the gurus were alive and the teachers were present. Um, they kind of got lost in the mix, you could say, post the, uh, the British being in the UK. Um, a lot of the history hasn't been documented, so it's hard to just kind of trace it back. 
Um, so the revival of global simply is within the UK's two main academies. And then the main difference between them is um, it's a lot harder to learn those instruments, is number one. Um, and number two is that it doesn't really require that much involvement of the congregation, but it requires a, a better, knowledge, um, better knowledge and skill of being able to play the music. Okay, so I'm kind of there now at the moment, and I'm trying to figure out how do we go for the <coughs> things. Um, the questions that come to mind is what role does this kind of music um, currently play in the lives of the, the next generation of, or second and third generation of Sikhs? With the influence of now social media and literally having most things on tap if we require it, how does this uh, help us to uh, from a practical point of view, based on what the scriptures say the role of this music is, uh, versus how we try to make sense of it from an identity, religious, cultural perspective within the UK. And how does how has this, if it has, transitioned from the previous generations? We all know when you have, uh, you've got your first priority moving some way is just to be financially, economically safe. Um, um, I'm trying to think, is it not Mendel so I'm mixing up the science. Um, there's a triangle uh, where you're trying to that's it. Um, Mendelssohn is, is genetics. Um, that's my old um, life. Uh, so yeah, Maslow is a hierarchy of trying to you know sustain all your basic needs first before you then try to make sense of um, of your life and the purpose of life. So I'm trying to see if it has that has that shifted in any way. And then looking at what are the motivations to learn Guru Sangeet and why. Um, it doesn't match the purpose of what Gita was there for. Sometimes people can go on the angle of being puristic on something, so this needs to be done this way, and this is the only authentic route. But is it more to do with the outcome that's required, and, and is that outcome what we're looking for right now? Um, and the final thing is, because the instrument types are totally different, um, is this something in the learning process of those instruments that helps to uh, connect within, connect with the, the shabbat, the word, and more so than maybe the instruments that were more popular back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? Right, um, like I said, I'm looking forward to hearing any conversations after this on this topic, um, but I hope that made some sense to all of you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Hello. Um, do you think there is a difference between hearing the sound from an electrical device versus on an instrument? Have you ever observed any difference in the connection with the divine from them two methods of listening? Especially the sort of new age music, there's been a lot of using, um, I'm, not, I'm not technical, <coughs> music, but you know, adding a bit of bass in there, just so changing the sounds of music. Um, but I, I know this doesn't maybe answer your question, but I've always found the live music in its raw form has, has a deeper impact than when I'm listening to it to an audio version. And that could be a combination of the environment that's created, even something simple as me walking in here. I felt calmer, and I, I realised now it's a mindfulness conference, which I didn't recognise. <laughs> it's, it's the impact, and I, and I, I know I, I, I tend to um, connect with the subtlety. So I think for me, it's, it, it combined with where the person is at that particular moment, the space and environment which the music is created, combined with um, the actual sound. So I, I'm saying there's definitely a difference, but I wouldn't be able to say one is better than the other, because sometimes you just got to get what you get. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm a fan of the Sikh scriptures, a fan of all of that culture. Um, I was trying to think of something helpful, really, okay. to say, and then you kind of set that up with your answer just now. Because I was wondering, you're, you're very interested in the history. You brought us that in great deal of colour and detail. You know, definitely seem like a social historian, as well as someone deeply interested within your faith culture. And I would be very interested in a study which is much more ethnographic. Okay. You know, where you go and you tell the story of Wolverhampton <coughs> Sikhs in 2019 mm -hmm. who are exploring these things. 
and you spend a year in people's homes, in people's gurudwaras, in people's that, what are they doing? Mm. And you really tell me with rich detail, because from your presentation, you're someone who likes that detail, you like the backstory, the current, and then you, that will give you themes that will emerge from that around identity, culture, uh, the sort of dissonance that can happen between the one generation to another, the purposes of that. And I think I would like to hear from you that colour. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, that has helped because you're not the first person that said that. I have a tendency to resist what I can, but can't be heard it twice and can't wait to do it. Um, hi, um, it's just a comment really. Um, um, I don't know that much about Sikh culture or religion. Um, for me, that was so fascinating, so interesting. Thank you for um, educating me and up as I suppose. So, um, likewise, um, I wanted more. <laughs> I always wanted, oh, please tell me more, and then it was the end. So, I definitely look forward to hearing some more at some point later in the future. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. about um, how much room there is for personal expression <coughs> and exploration within the music. Oh, do you mean like, like jazz? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I mean, because uh, you're talking about self-actualization. <coughs> and uh, so I'm curious about like how much space there is to be able to uh, explore inwards the personal, you know, the nuanced self yeah. by myself through musical expression. Uh, the reason why I'm putting jazz in there is because I um, the difference uh, one of the difference I've noticed in, in, is sort of with your European music or or music that has set pieces. You know, you have a script. These are the notes. These are, this is what you play. Within the, the raga setting, you have basically a set of rules. You know, you, these are the notes you can use uh, in this in this particular not necessarily this order, but you said you know you need to have this one follows this one. That's the rule. But you're pretty much allowed to go where you want with that. And um, what is great and what I like about that is when I, com when, I when it's combined with the, the sharper than the words, you're able to translate your own emotions through the instrument to um, to make sense to either one channel what you're feeling, so the instrument can help to channel your feeling, but also to create the sort of subtleties within sound that um, I, I find it hard to explain this, but the subtleties of sound that you you hear and you can um, process, which I think sometimes when it's a set piece. As beautiful as it is, and you, you, it, I think something you're like William and Jazz having that improvisation ability, so that each time you hear it, you hear something different, and each player would bring something new that's uh, original, that, that originates from their being rather than just a, a set place. Does that, does that help? That's what, that's how I see it. It's a way of almost channeling yourself through the music, um, but at the same time being true to the original message or what it's trying to be channeled through. Really. But in your, it's almost like you had a tube. And that tube, you know those, so yeah, I have really silly analogies. You know you've got milkshake, there's milkshake tubes that you have the chocolate thingies and you drink it and the milk turns chocolatey. Um, it's the same sort of thing, you're this funnel through which the milk comes, goes through and changes the colour according to who you are. But at the same time, you being in your authentic space allows that to be channeled in its truest form. Mm. So, mm. Sorry, chocolate milk. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's too, okay. <laughs> And it's based from a sort of Judeo Christian perspective. Um, when you've dug, when I've dug deep in the thought, especially when I've talked about this sort of the millennial generation of looking at Gurdjieff Singh to try and make sense of who we are outside the context of the frameworks that were set for us, what we're looking at is um, 
the way that God doesn't really quite exist in the way that we perceive it as something external. I prefer this, the, 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 the idea of sound or universe or something that's more inclusive and um, larger than that, whereas God ha has his own pictures. So basic understanding you might get through some of those websites that have had English translations, and I will say they have their place because I wouldn't be where I have an understanding of what I have without them. Um, but a lot of it is trying to learn what just certain words mean um, uh, in, a, in a real sense, not something that's out externally out there, something that, okay, well, how does that translate to me in my life right now? But that's the only resource that I can think of that I know that is used a lot and would make sense. Um, apart from that, what my list of things I'd like to do is actually look at the gr grammatical part of the language and understand it from the root. So instead of looking at somebody else's translation version of it, it's actually understanding when I see, I don't know, uh, uh, this particular letter with this um, particular tense on it, what does that meaning mean, how does that meaning change? You know what we learned right from day one at school, past, present, participle, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> which I don't forget. But that grammatical side, I don't know if that, that helps, but um, yeah. Right, um, we, have, we can have one more quick question. <coughs> if not, mm -hmm. Sen has just started to bless us, I guess. So we can have 15 minutes break and then we will be back over here at 11 a.m. Thank you very much.